I want you to go through the whole Quran with me. Join me at bayna.tv. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قال رب اجعل لي آية قال آيتك ألا تكلم الناس ثلاثة أيام إلا رمزا واذكر ربك كثيرا وسبح بالعشي والإبكار وإذ قالت الملائكة يا مريم إن الله اصطفاك وطهرك واصطفاك على نساء العالمين يا مريم قلتي لربك واسجدي واركعي مع الراكعين ذلك من أنباء الغيب نوحيه إليك وما كنت لديهم إذ يلقون أقلامهم أيهم يكفل مريم وما كنت لديهم إذ يختصمون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد سجن أبي والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته you normally don't find in Qur'an other than the story of Musa and Isa alayhi salam, the precursors to the coming of a particular prophet. You found in the story of Musa alayhi salam, from his birth, uh, the, you know, an entire account of what happened for him to be saved. And in the case of Isa alayhi salam, Allah azza wa jalla actually starts from his grandmother, then the birth of his mother, and then from his mother to his uncle, and the miraculous birth given to his uncle, and then to himself. Meaning his the birth of him, uh, you know, uh, from Maryam salamun alayha. So it's actually a, 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 a an incredible genealogy, importantly mentioned for Isa alayhi salam. Unlike any other prophet, you don't find this for Ibrahim alayhi salam. You don't find this for Salih alayhi salam. You don't even find this for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. Right? The reason that's important is because, of course, Isa alayhi salam is one of the most historically important figures on the planet. Uh, you know, the the majority religion of the world. Allah knew was going to be Christianity. It's a it's a it's a massive massive following of Isa alayhi salam, and it all goes back to who he's the son of, who he's the child of, right? So the, for the Christian faith, he's the son of God, and that had to be deconstructed. Muslims were going to go all over the world, and they were going to go deal with Christians, right? And so Allah azza wa jalla spent a lot of time in the surah, really outlining this most important part. Now compare this to Bani Israel in Surah Al-Baqarah. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah talks about all kinds of history of the Israelites. From the coming of Musa alayhi salam all the way through Jewish history. Like he highlights a lot of it, except he doesn't highlight Isa alayhi salam, the last chapter of Jewish history. That he didn't highlight. He highlighted that here. Why? Because, and, and so many different chapters were important, but in Christian history, what happened after Isa alayhi salam is not highlighted much at all. Because it's been a while, it's been six centuries, but not much of that has been mentioned. Because the only, the most important thing that needs to be mentioned is the truth about Isa alayhi salam. He is in fact one of the most famous, but also the most mysterious figures in history. There's so much debate about what really happened with him, who he really is, what his identity is. You know, there were early, early debates about whether he's an angel, whether he's a human being, whether he's, you know, even early Jews that, that accept, some Jews accepted him um, and accepted him as a, you know, there's even some groups like that around today, Jews for Jesus and that kind of thing, you know. So there's all kinds of debates surrounding him, which is why you would think for a moment when you're going through these ayat and we're going through these sessions, why is there so much emphasis, the, the build-up to the birth of Isa a.s. It's important because this is actually really relevant for those that have a love for Isa a.s. And you may just think about how much of a, what, what big of a deal it is every year when Christmas season rolls around. How many people are in the zone of the birth of Jesus and are, are thinking about that. Carols are being sung. And it's not just in the West, it's all over the world. It's really all over the world. And those are opportunities for us to share what we believe about Isa alayhi salam. Like my plan this year is when these durus are over, I'm going to actually just take these durus on the ayat of Isa alayhi salam, just release them on YouTube every year, re-release them in Christmas season. Just <laughs> because we need to know and we need to share and maybe somebody else will hear. You know, because Allah Azza wa Jal honors Isa alayhi salam in this profound way, and it's a very loving way of inviting people. Allah will also highlight. You notice that in in uh, Al Imran, Allah's anger was there uh, towards Banu Israel. Allah said, "I gave you preference over all other nations, and ni fadl tukum al alamin." 
right? And then min Allah. They drew upon themselves the anger of Allah. And there was this threatening language uh, actually by the end towards the Israelites that have abandoned إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِيهَا نَفْسَهُ They abandoned the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam and who could do so except someone fooling himself. So there's this harsh language towards the Israelites. There, here, to certain priests that came to visit the Prophet ﷺ, briefly there's harsh language, briefly. But for the most part, actually, even the Muslims are going to be taught, you know, among them there are, there are those who you can trust, they still recite the ayat of Allah, they're also good people, like Allah will actually soften us towards the Christian people. And by extension, some of the larger un, unfamiliar Jewish population. But majority here, the kalam, the, the, the discourses with the Christian people, Allah Azza wa Jal actually makes us... Um, appreciate them and actually build softer relations with them. So in, in, the, in the form of da'wah being given to them and also in the relations we're supposed to have with them, there's a softness here that wasn't there in the previous surah. Okay? And this is actually, interestingly, the, the difference between approach to those who do something wrong after knowing and those who do something wrong without knowing. Like your own kids. If your kids knew that they're not supposed to do this and they're doing it anyway, then you're angry. But if one of the kids made a mistake, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to drink that. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to touch that. Even though they made a mistake, you're not going to be angry with them. This is actually the distinction in the Fatiha of al maghdub alayhim and al dalin al maghdub alayhim, someone you're angry with. And al dalin someone just confused. Someone just got lost. And someone who just got lost, you can't be too angry with them. You have to take a softer approach with them and bring them back. And that's really what Allah Azza wa has done. Now, this, uh, what we're coming to now is an ayah about, you know, uh, Zakaria alayhi salam asking Allah for a sign. But before we do, there are two things that I wanted to make note of that I didn't get make note of in the previous ayat. One thing I wanted to remind myself of uh, is when, you know, Zakaria alayhi salam used to come into the room of Maryam and he saw food that doesn't belong there, food from out of season, and he was inspired and he asked for children. One of the, one of the lessons from that is, you know, rizq, um, is what you need for your sustenance. Like, I need food, I need clothes, I need protection, I need roof over my head. This is my risk. This is what she's being provided. She's being provided food. And when you see someone getting risk, you want risk for yourself too. You ask Allah, provide me also. But notice he didn't ask for something that actually he will see. He's already very old, he's gonna die soon. He sees the risk that she's getting in her life, but he's asking for a kind of risk that lives beyond his life. Dhurriyatan tayyibatan. And dhurriya meaning children, and even their children and their children, like future offspring. Inna ka dua. We're learning here that, you know, it's a really powerful sign of faith, of iman, that when you see someone having something good in this life, that it reminds you that I just don't want something good in this life, I just don't want fi dunya hasana, I want also wa fil akhirati hasana. Why? Because children that are going to do good after you die, they're actually providing you risk not for your body, not for your physical body, but they're providing you risk for your next life. That resurrection that's going to come, they're becoming a continuous charity for you. And that's what he wants. This is the sustenance he's interested in. He's not interested, Ya Allah, give me food that like she gets food. Give me a risk that like she gets this. He's interested in something more. And you know, what's an old man going to do with a child? It's not like the child's going to help him in the business or do something worldly. He has no worldly aspirations. The only thing he wants is that Allah's name should carry forward. The service of Allah's deen should carry. That's the only reason he wants a child. And so to him, that is a kind of risk. And so that changes our view of how we see what we should ask of our children. You know, some of our kids are going to be, you know, engineers. Some of them will be doctors, some of them will be teachers, some of them will, they'll go into different careers. They'll, they'll have their own skills and aptitude and they'll go in different directions. But one thing we should ask of all of them for, from Allah is that they become good children, that they do good. It doesn't matter if they're not imams or scholars or hufad of Qur'an, that's not, it's okay, not all of them are going to be that. And that's not what Allah wants either. That's not necessarily the case. You don't say, this child I'm giving to deen, the other kid's dunya. There's no such thing. There, there is no such thing. All of our children are children that are supposed to be in the service of deen and that doesn't take their, their career paths and their success in business, their success in studies, their success in medicine or whatever else, that doesn't take away from their success in their deen. They're, they still need to be dhurriya tayyibah. <clears throat> this distinction, unfortunately, we've, we've taught it to our children. 
to the point where we start thinking, you know, when my kids are going to the university, they're studying worldly things. And I wish they were, they were, they were serving deen also. No, going to the university is also a, a service to deen. That's not just a service to dunya. If you have the right mindset, if you're inspired by revelation, and that's what really we need to give our children, that's what makes them dhurriyatan tayyibah. Okay? Look at, you know, I'm, I'm always, I always go back to, you know, Yusuf alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam, because it's important. These are heroes, right? And they did not spend most of their life studying revelation. Right? Just think of it from one point of view. Yusuf alayhi salam spent his youth as a servant, and then he spent his youth in jail. And he's an incredible hero to us. We learn from him. But he never sat there studying Torah. Or he wasn't even given yet. He never sat there learning the teachings of Ibrahim He had a little bit of an education of Islam from his father before he was separated. And all this time, he's what we wish our children were. What we've done is we feel if our children know more about Islam, then they'll be good children. Then automatically, if we, if we, mem- if, if we have our kids memorize the Quran, they'll be good kids. If we have our children study, you know, take this class, this class, this class, or put them in Islamic school, get them, make sure they go through these, these, these textbooks, they will be good children. I'm not undermining the value of Islamic knowledge. But understand, knowledge and character are two worlds apart. They're two completely different things. There are kids that have no knowledge whatsoever, and they can be dhurriya tayyibah. And there can be kids that have incredible amounts of knowledge, and they are not tayyibat. They're not. That's a scary thing. But what, we, what we've done, unfortunately, is a kid has memorized the Qur'an in our culture. A child has put through madrasa to do hiv. They've memorized the Qur'an. They've led a couple of raka'ah and taraweeh. That's it. These are Ahlul Jannah. They're not. This is not what makes you... Rabbis knew Torah. They, they had a lot of ilm. That, that, that didn't make them good. Zakaria alayhi salam was making dua for a good child while he was surrounded by people that study the religion in the sanctuary. People of religion, a'imma, ulama, that were around him. And he was afraid of them because he didn't see goodness in them. And so our definition of goodness needs to be broader. And we need to understand that there's a difference between teaching the knowledge of religion and actually building character that the religion wants. And that character is far more important than the knowledge. And the knowledge is only there to, when the character is about to fail, that knowledge comes and helps again. Like, you know, Yusuf alayhi salam, when the time of temptation came, لَوْلَا أَرْرَأَ بُرْحَانَ رَبِّهِ That what he learned about deen kicked in at that moment. But, and then he's able to make good decisions again and good decisions again. So that's one thing that I thought it was important to, to highlight in the dua of Zakariya alayhi salam. The other thing is at the end when Allah you know, congratulated him that he's going to have a son named Yahya, the last description he gave was, وَنَبِيَّ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ A prophet from among the righteous. Which... Seems counterintuitive because Allah Azza wa Jal has given us a four category list of amazing people. The top is a Nabiyin. Then he says a Siddiqin. Then he says a Shuhada. Then he says a Salihin. What does that mean in English? He says the Prophet, you know, فَأُولَيْكَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ Those are the people that Allah has blessed, mean a Nabiyin, prophets, at the top. A Siddiqin, those who accept the prophets and tell the people that they're actually prophets, like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, these are a Siddiqin. A Shuhada, people that are willing to die in their loyalty to prophets, go into battle and die. A Shuhada. And then finally, a Salihin, good people. Four categories. At the bottom is what? Good people in general, right? And the, Sid, the Nabiyin and Siddiqin, you could say still possibly Sid, the, the door of Nabuwa is closed. Somebody who accepts that truth wholeheartedly can still be a Siddiq. Somebody who dies because they're holding on to their faith can also be a Shaheed today. And generally people who live a good life and stay away from prohibitions can still be a Salihin. So those doors are still open. But here, it's like Allah said, وَنَبِيًّا that Yahya is going to be a prophet, which is rank number one. And then he said, مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ from among a Salihin, which is rank number four. It's at the bottom. So, how is it that both of those things have been put together? Nabiya min al anbiya, a prophet from among prophets. But Nabiya min al salihin seems counterintuitive. Here you have to appreciate the use of the word min in the Arabic language. The word min, which means from, also means on the side of, belonging to the group of, or, or uh, siding with. So, for example, in the story of Musa alayhi salam, hada min shi'atihi wa hada min aduihi. This one is from the side of 
his group, this one is on the enemy side. فَأُولَٰئِكَ مِنْهُمْ Quran says, then they are on their side. They belong, يعني بمعنى معهم. They're with them. They belong with them. They have association with them. فَمَنْ تَبِعَهُ فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي Whoever follows me, he is on my side. That's one of the meanings of minni. Here, when the word min is used, it's actually saying that he's a prophet. One of the meanings is he's a prophet who will side with good people, who is going to be on the side of good people. Why is that important? Because when Yahya alayhi salam is going to grow up, he's going to grow up alongside Isa alayhi salam. And Isa alayhi salam, Allah has taught him Torah. So now there are two Torahs. The Torah that is taught to Isa alayhi salam and the Torah that the rabbis have. The one that has changes in it. There's two books, two versions of the same book. And they're both claiming, huwa min indillah. This is from Allah. Obviously that's creating a tension in that society. He's calling them out saying, that's not what Allah said. This is what He said. And now those, those are also religious leaders. They also have a group around them. They're also calling people to join them. And Isa alayhi salam is doing da'wah, are you okay? Yeah. okay? Isa alayhi salam is doing da'wah, he's calling people to them. Yahya alayhi salam is siding with Isa alayhi salam and the people and everybody who joins them, the, the other group is saying don't join them, they're deviant, they're a cult, they don't know what they're talking about, they don't even have ijazah, when did they become ulama? Why should you follow them? Be, be, beware of them. So they're actually, they're, there are two groups that are both claiming to be Muslim, in the same society, and they're pulled towards two different directions, and Allah Azza wa Jal then describes in a very subtle way that those who are going to be on the side of Yahya alayhi salam, he's going to side with those that are good. Because you know, for someone who doesn't know much, and he's just watching this, I trust these religious leaders, and he's saying they're all wrong. What am I supposed to do? Which way am I supposed to go? Allah Azza wa Jal kind of gave his verdict that his vote goes with whoever Yahya goes with. وَنَبِيَّ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ you understand? So he's going to side with those that are good, meaning the followers of Isa alayhi salam are not outlaws, they're not criminals, they're not bad people, they're actually the only good people. You know, this is important also because the original, right now, Christianity, I mentioned, majority religion in the world. But at the time, very, very few people believed the message of Isa alayhi salam. And they were actually considered outlaws and criminals. Which is why when the attempt to kill Jesus was done, then they were scattered. They couldn't even stay together because they were looking for them. They were actually considered rebels. And so those people Allah calls as salihin wa nabiyya min as salihin That's a very powerful, beautiful thing that Allah Azza wa Jal highlighted the way that the career and the mission of Yahya alayhi salam alongside Isa alayhi salam is going to go. So anyway, so those are the two things that were outstanding in my mind uh, about, about um, nabiyya min as salihin One more thing came to mind. Hasur, I told you to stay away from marriage. Like one of his qualities is that he's never going to get married and, and stay uh, celibate, etc. Hasur also, if you look at the Bible, there's another thing. The Bible even mentions he'll never have any drink. He'll never have anything, any wine or anything like that. Even though we believe that wine was already prohibited. And it, but, but they had made, you know, they had so many things that were haram, they had made halal on themselves. But he will never come even close to it. And actually, Isa alayhi salam never drank either. You know, and this is this is important because they in their in their changed books they attributed drinking to prophets, which we would never do, but they did. Okay, so uh, now let's come to the ayah. Qala Rabbi Jalli ayah. He said, Master, my master, uh, Zakaria alayhi salam said, give me a sign. It's really interesting. So far, something I didn't highlight in all of these stories. Did Allah speak to him or the angel speak to him? Angels. The angel spoke to him. The angel spoke to you know uh, to Zakaria alayhi salam and talked to him directly, and gave him the news, and he doesn't talk to the angel. He, he doesn't talk to the angel. He says, my master, give me a sign. Why? Because the prophets are clear. Well, even when the angels come, Allah is speaking. I don't have to talk to you, and then you go back and tell Allah. Allah is hearing all the time. In Naka Dua, you hear everything. So just because I'm hearing from you through an angel, doesn't mean you need to hear from me through an angel. You hear from me directly. He doesn't say to the angel, hey, could you uh, go back and tell Allah, I need a sign. 
He talks to Allah as if Allah's presence is there. Like the angel does not remove the presence of Allah. This was also important for the Christians to learn. What did so many denominations of Christians do? They placed angels between themselves and God. They call on saints and they call on angels. And they have amulets of angels and they call on those angels. Then the angels will protect them. The angels will be empowered by God and they will, the angels will protect them. Zakariya is in the presence, physical presence of angels and he still turns to Allah. My master, give me a sign. He doesn't even tell the angels, hey, did, did uh, my master give you a sign to give me? Nope. It's not up to you. That's from Allah. And when Allah wants to give me a sign, He will deliver that sign to you. Maybe He'll tell, you, tell me through you, but I don't need to talk to you. I need to talk to Allah. It's a profound, profound connection with Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Rabbi Jalli Ayah, Master, furnish a sign for me. Jala and Lam is to furnish and to provide. So place for me, but also furnish for me, provide me a sign. Qala ayatuka, Allah said, your, mirac- your miraculous sign is going to be, Allah tukallima nasa thalathata ayyamin, that you are not going to be talking to people for three days. You will not engage people in conversation for three days. Illa ramza, except by slow gestures, signs, ramz. Rams is actually, uh, uh, I'll get into the language of it later, for now it's okay to say slow gestures or, or gentle signs. Three days you won't be able to speak to people. Some people interpreted this to mean for three days he was supposed to fast, and the ancient fast used to be not only I'm not going to drink and, and eat like we're doing in Ramadan, but actually not speak either. Like fasting used to include not speaking. Okay. Um, but actually, if this was just a fast, meaning voluntarily, you know, tatawwan, lam yatakallam, he didn't talk, then how is that a miracle? That's, it says ayah, it says it's a miracle. Actually, the sign was that Allah took his ability to talk to people away. Allah took away his, he couldn't speak to people even if he wanted to. Which is why it's not Allah tatakallam, you won't speak for three days, it's you won't speak to people for three days. Notice what's going to happen after that. You won't speak to people for three days except by gesture, sign, motion. You remember when I said he's gonna, uh, he's gonna say my child's name is gonna be Yahya. How did he say it? He just wrote it down. He didn't say it, right? And even in the biblical record, he just wrote it down. But notice what he says after that. وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ كَثِيرًا Remember your Rabb a lot. Do a lot of dhikr. Dhikr is in the heart, but dhikr in Arabic also means to mention something. Meaning saying Alhamdulillah, saying Subhanallah, saying Allahu Akbar, saying La ilaha illallah. This is also dhikr on the tongue, okay? But how could it be? There's a contradiction. He says, don't talk and do dhikr. Well, if I can't talk, how am I doing dhikr? And then he says, وَسَبِّحْ بِالْعَشِي وَالْإِبْكَارِ Do tasbih, declare Allah's perfection in the evening and in the morning times. When the morning arrives. Well, that's because Allah said, don't talk to people, but keep talking to Allah. So every time he would try to do dhikr, it would be fine. His tongue would work. Every time he would remember Allah, he can do it. Every time he tries to talk to people, he can't talk. This is, a, this is a sign from Allah, you see? And so Allah Azza wa Jalla told him, this is the miracle that you've been given. Now some have um, interpreted this in different ways, three days because in the next three days she's gonna, gonna become pregnant and until that time I don't want you to speak to anybody. And others have added other sort of extrapolations. I didn't find them very convincing so I'm not mentioning those extrapolations. You're, you're, you're welcome to read them, those of you that are interested in Quranic studies. Ibn Ashur mentioned some of them. It's okay. I'm going to skip over that because it's not really very... Com- I didn't find it very compelling. Allahu ta'ala adam. And I, this is one thing I try to do in, in my uh, explanations here with you. If I find something compelling, I share it with you. If I don't find it as compelling, I might tell you, you can find it, even though I won't spend time on it. Okay? Or I might make just passing reference to it. And some of those things I, d- I didn't find appropriate to say about prophets personally, so I, I won't share it. Anyway, so he says... Uh, you know, give me a sign and Allah says you're not going to be able to speak to people for three days. Now, this is something that the Christians knew. The story is something the Christians knew. And I want you to know what the Christians knew. Muslims mostly, we don't know what the Bible says. And I don't read something from the Bible so that you say, oh, that's what God said to No, no, no. I want you to know how are the Christians thinking about this? And how did Allah change their thinking? So I'm going to read something to you from the Gospel of Luke about this story. The same story that we're reading in the Quran now. I'm going to tell you something that happens in the Bible. When he was serving as a priest before God, he's talking about Zachariah, okay, Zachariah they call him, right? When he was serving as a priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by Lot. Lot meaning he was chosen by a lottery system. 
a caste, according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and felt over and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer, prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will name him John. What does Quran call him? Yahya. Yahya. Okay. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children, to the disobedient, to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man. My wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until these things occur. In other words, it seems to be he's being punished for questioning Allah. He can't speak because he questioned Jibreel alayhi salam and Jibreel said, excuse me, I'm Jibreel. Allah talks to me directly. How dare you question that? Now you can't speak. Is that the story in the Quran? No. The Quran says he was overjoyed. And he said, Ya Rab, give me a sign that this amazing news is being, I, I want to have, you know, like, when, when uh, there's, there's winds, people that are very aware of the weather, they can just go outside, feel the breeze and say, oh, it's going to rain today. They can just do that. Ya Allah, give me some early relief that this is coming. He's not saying this because he doesn't believe. Also, it's like the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. وَلَكِنْ لِيَطْمَئِنَّ قَلْبِي He said, how do you bring life to the dead? He knows Allah does it. Allah says, do you don't believe? And he said, no, no just, to, just to make my heart feel at ease. And he gave him the story of the birds, right? So, Zakariya is out of joy asking for a sign. Ya Allah, give me a sign. And he's not just saying, give me a sign so you can prove that this is actually happening. Ya Allah, give me a sign when this is coming. I don't know if this is happening this month, in a year from now, tomorrow. When is this going to happen? Well, the moment you stop being able to speak, you know it's coming. It's actually, that's how you will know that this is actually on its way. And so when, you, when that hits you, don't think you've got some kind of disability you should know Allah's good news is around the corner. That Allah's good news, that this, this child is going to be born, is around the corner. This is how you will know that the conception will happen of the child. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah. This is Bible again. Meanwhile, the, pe uh, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was, when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After, this, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord had done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace that I have endured among my people. Meaning she couldn't have a child and that was considered a dis disgrace according to the, the, the Bible. In the Quran, Allah never mentions that not having a child is a disgrace. Allah doesn't, he doesn't ever say that, you know. And كانت امرأتي عاقراً is not, a, is not a, a, you know, a humiliating thing. And it's not like, you know, in some cultures, if a woman can't have a child, then you just say, you know what, I can't be married to you, or I don't want because you can't have a child, I'm letting you go. Ibrahim alayhi salam, old age, and his wife is the one who can't have a child still with him. You know, and she even said, you know, this, this husband of mine, old man, and I look at my age, and I'm aqid, I can't even bear a child, and they're still stayed married. Right? So this wasn't something to look down upon, at least in the, in the narrative of the Qur'an, it's not something to look down, uh, down upon. So now, قَالَ رَبِّ جَعَلْ لِي آيَةً قَالَ آيَةُكَ أَلَّا تُكَلِّمَ النَّاسِ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامٍ إِلَّا رَمْزَ You won't speak to people for three days except by way of motion. Rams in Arabic, uh, like for example, رَامَزَ نَاقَةٌ تُرَامِزْ لَا تَكَادُ تَمْشِي مِنْ ثِقْلِهَا وَالسَّمَنِهَا It's when some, an animal almost can't move, like when they make slow gestures. So he'll, his body will be extra relaxed and he'll make very slow gestures when he speaks. Um, I'll, I'll skip what Ibn Ashur said about this, uh, but, but go back to continue to وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ كَثِيرًا Remember your, your Rabb a lot. وَسَبِّحْ بِالْعَشِيِّ وَالْإِبْكَارِ And declare Allah's perfection night and day. 
uh, remembering Allah a lot and declaring His perfection is an important lesson here for the giving of children. Children will never be perfect, only Allah is perfect. Children will never be our, you know, something we deserve. It's a gift from Allah. Our Rabb gives, our Rabb takes away. When He decides to give, when He decides to take away is up to Him. Yahya did not live to see an older age. He died pretty young. He died actually uh, soon before Isa was taken up. Right, so our, well, how long our children will live and what role they will play, that comes from their Rabb. And that's why the word Rabb will be repeated a lot as, as opposed to Allah, the word Rabb will come up a lot here. Because Allah is not just mentioned as the only one or the one that's to be worshipped, it's the one that has the ultimate authority over you. That's where the, the word Rabb is about ultimate authority, you have no say, he has every say. You have no power, he has every power. That's when that word is used over and over again. So وَسَبِّحْ بِالْعَشِي وَالْإِبْكَارِ Now the story quickly switches. His story is dealt with. He's going to have his three days of silence. In the meantime, back in the quarters of Maryam Salamun alayha in her mihrab, إِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ When the angels said, Ya Maryam. Now Maryam, who only gets visited by who? Zakaria. It's the only one who ever visits her. Right? He's the one, that's her kafil, that's her caretaker. That's, that's why he's shocked, where did the food come from? All of a sudden, not food, but is actually a group of angels that have come. And the angels spoke to her, but in Surah Maryam, Allah describes that actually, even though a legion of angels came, one actually walked in. And the one walked in was, Jibreel فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيَّةً He looked to her like a man, an upright man. So he looks to her like a man, she doesn't know that's an angel. Some strange guy has walked into her room. And she was terrified. What, what intention could he possibly have? If we accept the Bible's account, and I don't see a reason not to accept it, she's just 16 years old. She's just a teenage girl. And some guy, just some you know, strong man has just walked into her room. And she's terrified. Anyway, now the, that part of the story where she was calmed down is not mentioned. Now it's as though Allah has skipped that part. And He's talking to us about when she's actually... At, at ease, and what, is Allah, what do the angels then say to her? And he, it's, it seems, if you accept literally the story from the Qur'an, that Jibreel salam calmed her down, but then she noticed other angels are there too. And they all then spoke to her and said to her, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاكِ No doubt about it, it is Allah in fact that has chosen you. All this time, you were chosen, you were chosen to be the one that Allah you know, makes into a female in the womb of your mother. When your mother had made dua, Allah chose that. When you were born, Allah chose that you should be the one being taken care of by a prophet named Zakaria. Allah chose that you should be allowed the honor that no other woman has been allowed, that you're going to be raised inside the sanctuary. Allah chose that. You didn't choose that for yourself. The, 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 the priesthood of the time, the imams of that time didn't choose that. Allah is the one who chose you like this. He, and istifa from Safwa, He chose you because how pure you are. He cho- and it's a pure choice that He's made. He decided why you should be chosen. Inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki. And He's cleansed you, He's purified you. This is a special tathir from Allah, like Allah has uh, uh, is, um, removed all imperfection and impurification from her spirit in a spiritual sense. He's, uh, it could also mean the same thing that, she, that his mother mentioned, or her mother mentioned, nadar. Nadar was to cut her off from all other worldly concerns. It's as though Allah is saying, He has purified you physically and also spiritually from every other concern. You've only been in the remembrance of Allah all this time. Wataharaki. And it's as though her upbringing up until now, from, from, from being a baby up until now, she's remained completely pure, and Allah has made sure that she stays that way. وطهرك. Also, this is the Qur'an's way of saying that she did not get married. That Allah has kept you pure. Because you know, in the, in the, the uh, Bible's version, she was handed off to Joseph, and we don't know what happened. In, in one version, that he never touched her or whatever, but there are other accounts and so we have here, وَطَهَّرَكِ Allah has kept you pure. And, Allah, and physically also pure. Because tazkiyah is spiritual purity. Tathir, tahara, is physical purity also. Okay, so it's so physically you've been kept pure and uncontaminated completely. Now, again, وَاسْطَفَاكِ And He has chosen you. And He's chosen you again. So there's the same exact word twice. إِسْطَفَاكِ وَطَهَّرَكِ وَاسْطَفَاكِ Why? The first choice was up until now, you are different than everybody else. Up until this age, you are especially chosen among all. From here on, there's another choice that's being made of you, 
that sets you apart from all women in, on earth. وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ He has singled you out and chosen you over in, for a certain mission that no other woman will ever be given. You will give birth a virgin. You will give birth without a man. And you will give birth to Isa salam. Like, you are chosen in a way that no other woman has ever been chosen. This isn't necessarily saying you are the greatest women, woman of all time. You have to understand that. This is actually saying that, you know, that, that, and that word, by the way, is faddala. Like, faddalnakum ala al We gave you preference, we gave you rank over everybody else. When you're making a choice over everybody else, for this particular task, you have been chosen for this pure, beautiful task like no other women of all of the nations of the world have ever been chosen. And of course, what she did, nobody's ever been given. So, وَاسْتَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ So there's two degrees of choice. And because of these two um, different sets of choice, it led Ibn Hazm rahimahullah and uh, Ibn Ashur after him and others after him to have a certain opinion about that. And I want to share that with you. I personally am more inclined towards this opinion, even though I'm not 100% sure, but I do find myself inclined towards this opinion. I'll share it with you. وَتَكَرَّرَ فِعْلُ إِسْطَفَاكِ لِأَنَّ الْإِسْطِفَاءَ الْأَوَّلْ ذَاتِي Allah repeated the word istafa because the first time he used it, it was for her personal upbringing. The first one because she's pure in character. The second because Allah has given her a preference or a choice, a rank above others. Which is why the first one Allah didn't say he chose you over. He didn't mention the word over the first time, but he did mention it the second time. It could be that the women of her time or the women of all times. Listen to this, but this is the opinion now. And angels coming and speaking to her, and the special choice of her being made in this way, indicate that she was actually given prophethood. That she was actually considered a prophet. And then he says, That prophethood, as opposed to being a messenger, there's a difference between prophet and messenger, that prophethood can be given to women. And the, I mean, what is it that makes somebody a prophet? Allah speaks to them through an angel directly and gives them revelation. Could you argue that this is the case here? Absolutely. Ibn Hazm argued that, rahimahullah. Ibn Ashur rahimahullah in at tahrir wa tanweer argued that, um, you know, in other places in the Quran, in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah says, Allahu yastafi min al-mala'ikati. Rasulullah wa min al Allah, Allah chooses messengers from uh, the angels and from among the people. But the word istifa is used for rusul, istifa is used for anbiya. Same word is used. So the fact that Allah uses the word istifa, and Allah is the one who has chosen you, it's by the way the same way that Allah talked about talut in Baqarah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاهُ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah, has the, Allah is the one that has chosen him over you. And he was given nubu'ah also. He was made a prophet also. So for those reasons, uh, you know, some ulama have considered that Maryam salamun alayha did re receive the rank of prophethood because of this. And th th this changes things because then there are things said about her in uh, the Bible that are inappropriate. Uh, and she's not spoken in the highest terms in some, in some places. And we reject all of those places. Outright because of this rank, and even if it wasn't the case, we'd reject it anyway. Actually, you know. Now, ya Maryam muqnuti li Rabbi ki washudi warkai ma al rakiin. Maryam, soften yourself before your Rabb. You know, I, I described qunut to you before al inqiyad when someone completely becomes submissive before someone else. Ihtiwa u batin al shay ala rakhawat al mutamakina fihi la tufariquhu kahal al sika. You know, when you have the leather pouch that holds water in it, and it keeps water in it for a really long time, and then the inside of it starts getting soft because of the water that's being contained in it, that's actually called qunut. And so when Allah says, uqnuti li rabbiki, soften yourself before your Rabb, keep your heart soft. You know what this also means? You're going to have, Allah hasn't even said you're going to have a child yet. That hasn't come up yet. All that's been said is, you've been chosen, you've been chosen. And you're, you're, you've been purified like nobody else. And so now Allah Azza wa adds, um, through the angels, Maryam, be completely submissive and soft towards your Rabb. Also means have a, 
uh, accept whatever Allah tells you to do comfortably. It's gonna, that's not going to be easy. And by the way, the, the, the command that she's going to be given and the mission that she's going to be given is a really hard one. And it's going to need for her to keep like a good opinion of Allah and a submission to Allah that's going to be hard to hold on to because sometimes obeying Allah in difficult circumstances becomes very difficult. You know, the heart is going one way, your feelings are going one way, obedience to Allah is going the other way. So the, the more important thing she's going to need is qunut, a submissiveness to Allah that even when things get bad, you just let go. The situation's out of my control, it's in Allah's hands. I have qunut, I'm obeying him, so I'm fine. He'll take care of it. That's a, that letting go is a really, really hard thing to do, you know? And it's, it's almost, if I give you a visual image, it's like you're out at sea and you're just floating and you're letting the waves take you wherever they want to take you, you know? And that's, that, that just giving yourself up to the waves is that you give yourself up to Allah and complete submission. I am at your command wherever you decide to take me, okay? I've done that, it doesn't work out well. Uh, so, <laughs> some wave comes and, you know. So, يَا مَرْيَا مُقْنُطِ لِرَبِّكِ وَاسْجُدِي وَرْكَعِي Make sajda, make sajda, make rukur. Put your head, prostrate your head on the ground and make rukur. Now, that's not the order of prayer. We don't do sajda first. We do rukur first. And then we do sajda. So it's the other order. But here, strangely, he says, وَاسْجُدِي وَرْكَعِي مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ A few years ago, I was doing research on uh, Jesuit Christians and some branches of Christianity because you know the Jews don't have sajda anymore right I talked to a rabbi about that they lament the loss of the prostration they do it once a year the most orthodox of them do once a year right that's what he told me I didn't make this up he told me himself right so I was like wow that's really sad because Ibrahim alayhi salam like if there's one thing we learn is antahira bayti al ta'ifin wal aqifin wal ruka so Jew, we're the people of sajda we're the people of Ibrahim alayhi salam how could you lose sajda you know, by the way, at least they had ruku' left, right? And so, what does Allah do when He invites the Israelites? He says, "Warka'u ma'al raki'in, make ruku' with those who make ruku'." Meaning, at least you still have ruku', but the real ruku' is being done by the Prophet and and his followers. He's being told, she's being told, "Uqnuti li Rabbiki wasjudi, make sajda." Now, sajda, if you if you notice in the Quran, where is sajda mentioned? Sajda is mentioned when something overwhelming happens. Sajda is mentioned when something happens that is just, it can only be from Allah and you are overpowered by Allah as if your knees buckled, you collapsed and you can't even stand anymore. You're so overpowered by Allah's power and you just bowed your head into the ground in humility to God. This is what the, angel, this is what the magicians did when they saw Musa's stick turn into a snake. They couldn't handle it. They fell, ulqiya saharatu sajideen. When Yusuf's brothers saw that this is our brother, the one we threw in a well, and he's now feeding us, he's in charge of us. What happened to them? They fell into sajda, kharrusu jadan. When, you know, uh, Christians came to meet, another, another time Christians came to meet the Prophet ﷺ, heard the speech of Allah, heard the word of Allah, and guess what happened to them? Yakhirruna lil afqani sujjadan. They fell on their faces in sajda. Every time something overwhelming happens, something overpowering happens, then sajda is called for. She's given this incredible honor. And by the way, sajda means that I am in awe of Allah, I am humbled by Allah, I feel overpowered by Allah, and I also feel incredibly grateful to Allah. Sajda is also sajda of shukr. And so here, when he says, wasjudi, this is a very powerful moment, you need to be in sajda. And it also means out of gratitude to Allah, fall into sajda, wasjudi. And then he says, and make ruku' along with those who make ruku', bow along with those who bow. In other words, still join the congregational prayer. She's in the masjid after all, right? And so in a, in a very subtle way, even though you've been given this rank, that doesn't absolve you from the regular responsibilities that a Muslim has. You know, sometimes in, in um, certain spiritual you know, leanings, people say that I have a personal connection with Allah and it's so powerful that I don't need to pray with everybody else. Because you know, when I'm by myself doing dhikr of Allah, I'm this close to Allah. But when I join the, you know, when I join the prayer with everybody else, I feel it's more formal. It's everybody else's around. That connection, that personal connection isn't there for me. Achha, you're more special than, 
than Islam's own teachings. You know, there was a famous uh, mystic that used to say when he would remember, he would sit there in the corner just remembering Allah and when the adhan would be called, he would say, I was in, you know how you have, the, the king has a palace and the, you have the inner, you, you know, you're, you're in, at the throne, you're right by the throne of the king and then there's the courtyard outside and when the adhan would be called, he would say, man, I was sitting at the throne, now I'm being called to the courtyard. Right, because he was essentially saying, I was so much closer to God by myself, and now the, the congregational prayer, you know, the guy next to me is going to be burping, and you know, this guy's socks are smelly or whatever. Like, this is not a spiritual experience for me. Allah Azza wa Jal shatters that in the Quran in simple ways. When Allah says something will bring you closer to Allah, it is actually it's it's a it's a climax. So the the you know the when things are mentioned in progression, it's the the greatest of them is at the end. Often, especially in, in worship. So what do you have here? You've got submiss be submissive and keep your heart soft to your towards your Rabb. Uknuti li Rabbiki. That softness should compel you to do sajda. What's judi? And that is that same softness and that sajda should make you even more committed to what? Congregational prayer. Warka'i ma'ar raki'i. Make ruku'ah with those who make ruku'ah. Stay humble within. And by the way, this is a subtle, subtle, beautiful way of saying. When, when she's going to be given the, the, the miracle of birth, does she want to be around people? No, she doesn't. Because it's humiliating. People are going to say all kinds of stuff. There's a subtle hint in make ruku'ah with those who make ruku'ah that even though you're going to go far away and have this child, you're going to have to come back. You're going to have to make ruku'ah with those who make ruku'ah. You're going to go join the community back. And basically, it's, it's almost like Musa being told, return to the Pharaoh. Right? But come back and you will find support. There will be those who will believe. Don't worry. There will be those who make ruku'ah. They won't all dismiss you. She doesn't even know about the child yet, but she's being told, don't leave the community. In the words, وَرْكَعِي مَعَ الرَّكَعِي Anyway, the, the research I was doing on uh, some Jesuit Christians that, have, that still believe in Torah, and they abide by Torah, they eat the kosher. They're Christian, they believe in Jesus. But they, 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 and a lot of them actually don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. They actually believe He's a prophet. So they're very close to Islam in many ways. And some of them are found in Jerusalem to this day. And their prayers normally don't get recorded. Like you, you don't normally see their, um, I mean, some people, like, you know, secretly, whatever, make some film or whatever. And you've seen, you know, you know what they do? They make sajda first, rukur second. And I did some study on this. Actually, in the prayer of the Israelites, when sajda was there, sajda used to be first, rukur used to be. Second, in our prayer, the Prophet's prayer, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, ruku is first, sajda is second. Because this is the Israelites, because it's the law of Torah, because it's the original teachings of that book and that Sharia. Notice the sequence is actually corresponding to the way that they used to pray: sajda first, ruku second, wasjudi, warkai, ma'arakain. In other words, both sajda and ruku could be with those who make ruku, but rather it's sajda by yourself, meaning be grateful to Allah by yourself, and then join the congregational prayer. يَا مَرْيَمُ قُنُتِ لِرَبِّكِ وَالشُّدِي وَرْكَعِي مَعَ الرَّاكِنِينَ So inshallah ta'ala at this I'll, I'll stop our dars today at ayah number 43 and we're about to get into some pretty heavy stuff Isa alayhi salam himself uh, that's, the, that's what's now uh, uh, around the corner and this is where there's quite a bit of debate and controversy especially more recently some Muslims have started doubting whether or not Isa alayhi salam is coming back and they're giving their reasons and I'm going to dig into some of that with you guys, inshallah ta'ala. Just look at both sides of the argument. And then, you know, because I, I personally don't believe that if somebody makes a claim about Islam, that we immediately say that these people are kuffar or they're deviant or they're wrong or, you know, they're not Muslim anymore, etc. for what they say. You know, academic views are academic views. And we should discuss them with an open mind. And, you know, this is what Islam is. Islam is inquiry. Allah wants us to believe something after looking at evidences. And maybe the evidence is I find compelling, you don't find compelling, and that's okay. So long as you sincerely follow what you, did, what you try to figure out to the best of your ability. That's really what's being asked of you. That's what's being asked of me. And so inshallah ta'ala, well, I'm going to try to present, I will give you ahead of time. I do believe he's coming back. I, I am convinced of that. And I'll share my reasons for being convinced of that. A lot of that is, it comes from hadith literature. right? And I openly say I'm not an expert or... Uh, you know, um, experienced in the science of hadith. I go to experts and rely on their, uh, you know, opinions, living ones, not, not those have passed, but living experts in hadith. Uh, and I go and inquire with them and ask them hard questions, questions I would never say in public, but I ask them because I have no shame in private. 
to ask those questions because I need to know for myself. And I play, I don't want to say devil's advocate, but I play a difficult student advocate when I, when I do my research. Uh, and then I get my answers and then I try to present what I find most convincing. And so even though many of you consider me a teacher, I want you to consider me a, a fellow student. That's really what I want you to consider me. As you're studying Qur'an with me, you're not studying Qur'an through me, you're studying it with me. I'm helping you learn some things and I'm enabling you to do your own work, to do your own study and to do your own reflection into the Qur'an. And this is really the nature of Qur'an. No one has authority over it. All of us are just trying to seek it. Some may be a, a little bit ahead of others and we have to ma maintain that humility that the word of Allah is supreme, we will never be. We're never gonna have any authority over it. So may Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, help us in our journey into his book and allow us to reach guided conclusions. And those conclusions will not just come from research and study and language and grammar and history and books and scholars. That will come when Allah hablana min ladunka rahma. Right, when Allah gives rahma from his special behalf, then Allah opens the heart and the mind and the mind goes towards a guided direction. That at the end of the day is the only thing that matters. Because when we engage revelation in the beginning of the surah, it wasn't about you better study the language carefully, you better do your research. The thing was, people who truly have knowledge know that when they come across difficult passages and ayat, they turn to Allah and say, give us mercy from your behalf. That's the attitude of al-rasikhuna fil ilm. Allahumma ja'alna min al-rasikhina fil ilm. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikil hakim. Very proud of you boys. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.